What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, let's open the Word of God to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to continue to take a look at what is known as the parable of the soils, the parable of the soils, a very familiar parable to students of Scripture. We're uh, going to dig a little deep into the dirt, if you will, on this one, go down into the soil and discover all that we can as to its meaning. But let me remind you of the story itself in the opening eight verses. Mark 4, He began to teach again by the sea, that is, Jesus, by the Sea of Galilee. And such a very large crowd gathered to Him that He got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And He was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in His teaching, "'Listen to this, behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came up and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil, and after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns or the weeds, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. Everybody would have understood the story. Uh, Everybody was familiar with this. This is Galilee. This is around the Sea of Galilee where there were fields as far as the eye could see. Everybody had experienced this kind of thing as a part of their daily routine all the years of their lives. The story is simple enough. They all knew that uh, not all the seed that was thrown was going to be productive. They, they knew about hard ground and rocky ground and weedy ground and good ground. So in that sense, it was a very, very simple story about very familiar things. However, the last statement of Jesus would have been the wow factor in the story where He said, Other seed fell into the good soil, and they grew up and increased and yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. That's the wow factor because that kind of product would never happen. No planting ever had that kind of return. So that was not ordinary. That was uncommon, and that caused them to wonder, what is He talking about? On the one hand, the sower looks like he is very unsuccessful in the first three soils, but in the last three, the success is beyond comprehension and expectation. It was not uncommon for Jesus to include in His parables that kind of an element that shocked people, and this would be that very thing. Simply enough, it's a story about soils and their difference. Simply, some are non-productive, some are very productive. Simple enough. But what's it talking about? What's the point of the story? This parable is designed to help us understand gospel evangelism. That's what it's designed to do. It's included in Matthew 13, it's in Luke 8, and it's here. It's given in Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's so very important, it needs to be repeated three times. Now we all know that the church exists in the world for the purpose of evangelism. We're here to fulfill the Great Commission to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, make disciples of all nations. That's what we do. We have been called to this mandate. That is the chief 
goal of the church in the world. All other goals are intermediate goals, uh, becoming holy, being obedient, worshiping the Lord. All these things, coming to spiritual maturity, are to make us into the kind of Christians who have an effective witness because our lives back up our testimony. But the ultimate end for which we live in the world is the proclamation of the gospel. So this is right at the heart of why we're here and what we do. We proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the church does. Our call is not into politics or morality. It is to the proclamation of the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so this is a very, very important parable for us to learn how the responses are going to come. Here we are left in the world, every generation of Christians, one after the other after the other until the Lord comes, with this responsibility to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth, and frankly, we can get very frustrated at it. For many Christians, the effort seems disappointing, daunting, discouraging. We even get to the point where we give up. Maybe that's because we don't really understand what this parable is telling us. There are efforts to fix this dilemma that the evangelicals are in. We we give out the gospel and it's rejected or it's received superficially or it's received temporarily. What's the problem? Why is that kind of response so consistently true? Contemporary evangelical mood would say, it's our fault. The the fault is with us. Um, We're out of touch with the culture. We're out of touch with style. We're out of touch with the psychology of how people think or the psychology of sales or the psychology of overcoming consumer resistance. We're out of touch with popular thinking. We're not connecting with people. And beside the fact that we're really inept sowers, the seed is offensive. The message is offensive. I mean, if you want to fill your building, if you want to fill your 20,000 stadium with all 20,000 seats occupied, You're going to have to come up with another message than the one about hell and damnation and judgment and repentance, etc. We've got to start talking about something that appeals to people on the level of their self-desires, their felt needs, their personal longings. We need a more acceptable message and we certainly need more cultural savvy. In other words, in the language of the parable, the problem is with the sower and the problem is with the seed. In the case of the sower, now well, the sower might need a new wardrobe, really, might need a black t-shirt with skull and crossbones and jeans with holes in the knees. That'll do it. And how about maybe he needs a designer seed bag? And then if you can just look like that and put rock music in the background, consumer resistance will fade away, really. So feverishly misguided are efforts in this direction that they're everywhere trying to fix the sower and the seed. It's a waste of time, absolute waste of time. The seed is perfect, first of all, and if you do anything to alter it, you've just corrupted it. A mutated gospel is no gospel, can't tamper with the gospel. And any sower with any wardrobe and any seed bag will do as long as he or she is sowing the gospel. Why? Because Jesus is telling us here, the issue is not the sower and it's not the seed, it's the soil. The issue is the soil. The issue is the heart. That's the issue. We are so bent on the style of the sower and creating some kind of synthetic acceptable seed 
that we've mutated the gospel into such a corrupted form that it no longer has the power to save because it isn't the true gospel. I've become continually exercised about this to the degree that I'm in the process, even as I speak, of putting together a document that I, I'm going to get somewhere, I don't know, Newsweek magazine, the Wall Street Journal, somebody send it to a lot of places and say, I just want to make it clear that the kind of Christianity that you see on the television with the prosperity gospel and all of that other stuff is not Christianity. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ and we want to distance ourselves from it. Somebody needs to know that's not Christianity. That's not biblical Christianity. That's not historical Christianity. Biblical historical Christianity is the true gospel of Jesus Christ preached in its purity and its clarity. The church won't do anything about it, seemingly. Christian leaders don't want to address the issue, so maybe we can, uh, we can get the world to take a look at it. So that's what this is about. On the one hand, proclamation of the gospel can be a little bit discouraging. Right? You're going to run into the hard ground. You're going to run into the, the superficial where somebody responds for a moment, it doesn't last very long, and they're gone. You're going to run into the person who uh, makes a temporary commitment, but because they never really let go of what they truly love, the things of the world, they also disappear. It's very discouraging. We've all been there. We've done that. We've seen that. But on the other hand, you can't forget the supernatural half of the story, right? Where the soil is prepared by God, the results are staggering. There's enough motivation in the 30, 60, 100 to keep us going. I mean, you got to get to that part of the parable, and we will someday, <laughs> not today. Now, so that's the parable, and that's kind of the intent of the parable, and we talked about that two weeks ago. Let's look at verses 9 to 13, we're just reviewing now. The hearers, Jesus uh, says in verse 9, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's a very important comment and we, we've, we, we talked about it a little bit last time so I won't go over that again. Not everybody can get the message. I've obviously, as I told you, a parable unexplained is a riddle. And if you don't explain this and you don't explain what you mean by it, then I can't even fathom its significance. But He says it's limited. Uh, th this is limited to those who have the ears to hear. And then it immediately introduces us to those who do. Verse 10, as soon as He was alone, His followers along with the twelve began asking Him about the parables. The ones who had the ears to hear were the ones who believed in Him. He doesn't cast His pearls before swine. He now speaks in parables to the crowd. Go back to verse 1. The crowd is so large, he has to get off the shore in a boat in order to keep from being crushed. And they all heard the story, but not until he was alone with his disciples and the twelve did they get an explanation. The understanding of the truth is not for everyone, it is for his followers. In verse 11, he explains it. He was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables. Wow. Now let me stop there and tell you something. That, dear friends, is a judgment. That is a judgment. Absolutely a judgment. Jesus didn't always speak to the crowd in parables. This is a change. This is a shift. He spoke to them clearly, told them the truth, revealed the gospel, salvation by faith called for repentance, belief in Him as the Messiah, but they rejected Him. Their rejection has reached a final point as we saw back in chapter 3. Remember when they said He does what He does by the power of Satan and the leaders said it and the people bought into it? They are now on the outside and the implication is they're fixed on the outside because He quotes from Isaiah 6, 9, seeing they may see and not perceive. Hearing, they may hear and not understand. Look at this. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. Whoa. Now, you know you've gone too far when God Himself prevents you from believing and being forgiven. They had gone so far 
so far that the door was shut. And they were only going to be hearing Him speak in parables that were unexplained. Now He hides the truth from them. Matthew chapter 13, it's worth reading the, the verses 34 and 35 of that chapter. Matthew's um, including these words from Jesus in this same context. It says in verse 34, all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. He didn't speak to them without a parable. This is a tremendously important turning point. All they get now are riddles they can't understand because they won't understand, they can't understand. So like Pharaoh hardened his heart and now God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why? He, he didn't speak to them without a parable to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 35, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. That's a prophecy from Psalm 78. That's Psalm 78 verse 2. Let me tell you something interesting about that. Psalm 78 verse 2, Psalm 78 introduces a parable, a dark saying, a hidden saying that is then the basis of a judgment pronounced on Israel. Now if you follow that idea along in the Old Testament, I'm going to tell you something you need to think about. You can, you can look at it when you read your Old Testament in the future. Parables in the Old Testament are connected to judgment. Parables in the Old Testament are connected to judgment. Psalm 78 is that illustration. It is a dark saying, it is a hidden saying, it is a parable. It's stated to be a parable in verse 2. The parable is given and the parable then is a picture of Israel's judgment. When you come to 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan tells David a parable, a parable about a man, a man who had some sheep, a neighbor who stole his sheep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that is a parable that ends up in a pronunciation of judgment on David in Judges chapter 9, verses 1 to 21, Gideon's son Jothan tells a parable to the men of Shechem because they had chosen the murderous Abimelech to be their king and killed all his brothers. And the parable is told and then it is explained as divine judgment coming on those sinful people. In Ezekiel chapter 17, chapter 24, you have Ezekiel giving a parable that is explained as a judgment. In Isaiah chapter 5 and chapter 6, you have Isaiah giving a parable that begins in chapter 5 about the vineyard and he, the question is even asked, what is this vineyard and who is he talking about and what's going on here? And he pronounces the Babylonian judgment on Israel. Their captivity when they were hauled into Babylon is the meaning of the parable. So what our Lord is doing here, this is a significant turning point in His ministry. When He starts talking in parables, He is saying judgment has come. They had rejected when they could understand and now they can't understand. These parables are judgments on Israel's rejection. They cannot understand. They cannot comprehend. They cannot then turn and be forgiven. And their judgment will come. And their judgment did come in 70 A.D. in the destruction of Jerusalem and those who were still alive by then would very likely have been slaughtered and catapulted into a godless hell. This is a very critical moment in the life of the ministry of our Lord Jesus. And He uses the illustration of Isaiah because that's such a dramatic parallel because that's a parable in chapter 5 that ends up in a pronunciation of judgment at the end of chapter 5 and on into chapter 6. So Jesus is going to speak to His own and explain this parable. It's critical for them because they need to know what to expect. You can imagine that um, having watched Jesus do evangelism, what do you think they would have concluded? Well, what did they conclude? I told you that two weeks ago. They came to Him and said, why are so few being saved? What's going on here? You know, you're supposed to be the king and this is supposed to be the kingdom. 
This is the kingdom having arrived. The kingdom has broken into human history. The Messiah is here. Well, nothing's happening. What's going on? And, and the, the first three kinds of soil, well, that was nothing new. Nothing new at all. They saw the hard ground in the Pharisees. They saw the superficial ground in a lot of other folks, some disciples who followed for a little while and went away. They saw all that. What our Lord wants them to see in the story is the thirty, sixty, hundredfold, that you can't see it now, but you are going to see it in the future. In fact, the next uh, few sections in this chapter in Mark 4 kind of build on this, particularly verses 26 to 29 where it talks about you sow and you go to bed and the crop comes up because uh, there are powers beyond you that produce it, and it's going to grow. It's even going to grow like the next parable, a mustard seed, starting small, becoming huge. So this is a parable meant to encourage. It's meant to explain the resistance and the rejection, but to encourage with the great inexplicable results. So let's go to the explanation in verse 14. The explanation. In verse 13, He said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Of course, no. They need to be explained. And uh, how will you understand all the parables? You, you have to have an explanation for everything. Verse 14, the sower sows the Word. Now let's first of all look at the sower. What does it say about the sower? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It doesn't say what kind of clothes he wore or what kind of bag he had. It's just anybody who sows. Anybody faithful to proclaim the Word is a sower. All of us do that. We're all commanded to do that. And if you for any minute think that it's connected to your style or it's connected to your um, personality or it's connected to your wardrobe or it's connected to the music, uh, you better think again. You better think again. This is just the sower, and a sower is defined as simply somebody who sows the Word. Anybody who throws the, the Word, what is, what is the issue then? The seed, the seed is the Word. Uh, the seed, says Luke 8, 11, Luke's parallel, is the Word of God. It is the Word from God, the saving gospel, the Word of the kingdom, if you will, the gospel of the kingdom, the message that God has sent the biblical gospel. Can we say that? It's the biblical message. Faith comes by hearing the, the Word, Romans 10. We're begotten again, 1 Peter 1, by the Word. In um, 2 Peter 1, it says that uh, everything pertaining to life and godliness has been granted to us through the true knowledge of Him. And that true knowledge of Him is revealed in Scripture. So the sower is anybody who sows the seed. The seed is the Word of God. I don't need to beg the issue, but 1 Thessalonians 2.13, you remember Paul says concerning the Thessalonian believers uh, that he is so grateful, he is rejoicing in the Lord because they received, he says in chapter 2, verse 13, the Word of God which you heard from us. You accepted it not as the Word of men, but for what it really is, the Word of God which also performs its work in you who believe." It's the Word that has the power. You all agree with that? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the, the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. The power is in the Word. Any sower who sows the Word therefore wields the power. If you follow this through the book of Acts, you come into chapter 4, verse 31, what do they do? They proclaim the Word of God. Chapter 6, verse 7, what do they do? They proclaim the Word of God. Chapter 8, verse 14, they proclaim the Word of God. Chapter 11, verse 1, chapter 12, verse 24, chapter 13, verse 5, verse 44, on and on. They, they said nothing but the Word of God, the Word that came from God, the biblical gospel. This is the seed, the, the living and abiding Word of God by which we are given life. So the, the issue in the story here is not the sower. It doesn't do any good 
to tamper with the sower. And you certainly don't want to tamper with the seed. To say something as foolish as, well, we'd be much more effective if we changed our style or if we changed our message is ludicrous when compared with the simplicity of this parable. The issue does not lie with the sower. It is irrelevant. The sower's personality, the sower's wardrobe, the sower's style, there's only one possible seed containing the power, and that's the true gospel. So the issue in the variables here is what? The soil. The soil. I'm amazed at how many people who would affirm Reformed theology and would refer, affirm the sovereignty of God in salvation who don't seem to get this, don't seem to make the connection. 